Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. And we're talking about how God-given dreams come true. Afterward, that's an interesting word because it provokes my mind to wonder after what? Afterward, the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision and said, don't be afraid for I will protect you and your reward will be great. One of the most frustrating and confusing things we all encounter in this journey on earth is when we seem to be moving, but we're not making any progress. You ever feel that way? You got a dream, but you're not achieving it. It's those times in your life when you've got motion, but you don't have momentum. The Bible indicates God's desire for His people is for us to always be growing, not at the same rate, but growing, advancing, moving from one level of grace to the next level, from one level of victory to the next level, and from one level of abundant living to the next. It's little by little, like going to the gym. You don't pick up 400-pound barbells on your first day with your little spandex outfit. You start off with little pink ones at 20 or something, and then you start adding to it, right? You get stronger. You turn that fat into muscle and steel. So, in the kingdom, there's no such thing as static, stale, stationary about our God. So, contrary, there should be nothing stale or stationary or static about our life. See, we're to grow from glory to glory, from faith to faith. I ought to be getting better at this. If you've been a Christian five, ten years, for God's sake, you ought to be better, right? Some of you not, you're afraid to vote. Okay. I'm telling you, you ought to be better. You know, you can learn to fly the space shuttle in six months. For God's sake, what is it you can't learn about marriage, handling money, good health, relationships, kids? We ought to be better at what we do. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Amen. Okay. Somebody call 911. I see dead people. <laughs> but a lot of believers and certainly most unbelievers, get frustrated by the fact that they're, they look back over their lives in the 21st century, and they realize they've made very little, if any, progress, that their God-given dreams have never yet been realized. Now, you may have been busy, but made no progress. You may have given effort, but there's no improvement. You may have been diligent, but there's still no development. You may have received that dream, but you haven't achieved it yet. William Carey is considered by many to be the human catalyst behind modern-day missions. And he used to say this, expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. We don't honor this God of, of unlimited power and potential by living small, thinking small, dreaming small. Dream big. Think big. Honor God. Expect great things from God. It ought to be like, I'm not surprised. I expect it even more. Have high expectations from an unlimited God. In God's Word, there are a lot of people who lived out this way of life, people who lived an abundant, successful life. They're people who dream big for God, and they achieved their God-given dreams. So considering these biblical examples, and by reading about their life, I hope I can challenge you to become a big dreamer for God as well. If you once had big dreams, but you've now, because of time or setback or failure, you've become discouraged about whether or not that dream is ever going to be realized, these scriptural models can help all of us dream again, re-engage that dream. God says, my gifts and my callings on your life are irrevocable. God has not changed His mind. You may have, but He hasn't. So I'd get into agreement with God if I were you for 2020. Our text here that we read just a few moments ago is unique because it contains the first mention in the Bible of two important words, vision and reward. Verse 1, Genesis 15, afterward, the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision and said to him, don't be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you and I will be your exceeding great reward. That verse contains three great attitudes for fill, fulfilling or achieving your God-given dreams. Here's the first one. Realize your dream will be tested. 
I don't care how sweet you are, pretty you are, nice you are, you don't smoke, you don't drink, you don't chew, you don't run with those who do. Oh, you glow in the dark, you go to chosen women of the word, a glow. Step up, baby, you are going to be tested. Everything God promotes gets tested. You don't get promoted unless you pass the test. So God is not into... uh, you know, well, you've been here a long time, I'll let you go. No, no, no. If you want the reward, you have to pay the price. Now, going to heaven is free. Jesus paid that. But having a good marriage, having good health, handling your finances well, getting along with others in relationships, and fulfilling a dream, you pay for. And the value of your dream is what you're willing to pay for it. So if you want a Kmart blue light markdown special, that's what you'll have. And you can look around at people and say, well, they didn't pay much, did they? Remember, you don't pay to go to heaven. You pay living on earth. And so God expects you. The greater the, the, greater the reward, the greater the price. That's the way life works. I'm sorry to break your bubble, but just because you don't do anything bad might mean you don't do anything. I know it's tough, isn't it? <laughs> Your dream will always get tested. The first word of our test, uh, of our text, needs a little explanation. Afterward. Remember that word? Afterward. After what? What had been happening in the life of Abraham up to this point? Let me review the three preceding chapters before afterward. In Genesis chapter 12, God calls Abraham to leave his home at age 75. How many people in here over 70? Yeah, look at that. We got a few. Hey, life begins at 75. Are you kidding me? This is when God gets the thing rolling. What are you doing drooling on yourself, shopping for Depends, and and talking retirement, and AARP, and Medicare, and Social Security? For God's sake, you got a big adventure ahead of you. Holy Moses. 75, God calls him. Moses was 80. Okay. Sorry for preaching. I do have a license, but we live in a culture of retirement. It just irks me, you know. So he sets out, this guy, Abraham, Abram, he sets out. He doesn't know the location of the promised land that God's sending him to. And shortly afterward, Abram finds himself in the middle of a famine, lack, want. He's forced to take his family, his servants, his flocks, and all of his herds down into Egypt. And while he's there, he lies about his wife being his sister so that Abimelech won't kill him. Abimelech takes Sarah into his harem. By the way, she's 90. Does that intrigue you at all? Either he's on drugs or she is hot. How many gals in here like to be hot at 90? (laughs) That just proves God can do anything. Well, she's 90 and he's 100. 100. But he lies because in that culture, if I wanted to, if I'm the pagan king and I want what I want, I can kill you to get it. I can kill you to get her. And so he lies and says, she's my sister. It's it's kind of a half truth. But anyway, God protects her in spite of Abraham's deception, and he returns her to Abram untouched. It was pretty clear that was going to happen because God appeared to Abimelech. This pagan says, if you touch her, I'll kill you. He suddenly felt very virtuous. You know what I'm saying? I love to open the Bible up instead of sitting around, everybody stuffy. And I mean, it's pretty occasionally erotic. Sometimes it's violent. Sometimes it's nasty. But it's life. That's the way our lives are sometimes. This character flaw in Abraham didn't cover up, isn't covered up in Scripture. One of the reasons we know the Bible is true and it's trustworthy is that God always exposes everybody in there as weakness. He tells about their dirty, nasty little scandals. He tells it. If I were writing it, I wouldn't tell it. And so he lied. And you could claim, as Abram did, that technically she was his sister, the daughter of his father, but not his mother in Genesis 20, verse 12. But when she became his wife, then that was the relationship by which they were to be known. So there's no excuse for what Abram did, but it didn't stop his journey to obey God because of his own failure. And let me point out, whatever your failure has been in the past, don't let that stop the dream that God gave you in your heart. These people failed too. 
and yet they went on to achieve great things with God, and so can you. So we see in Genesis 12, Abraham's dream was tested by famine and by personal failure. In Genesis 13, Abram separates from his nephew Lot because they've got a war going on between their herdsmen. There's not enough grazing land for all their flocks and herds. So Abram lets Lot take his pick, which way to go, what land to take, and he chooses rather foolishly. He picked the lush land that's connected to the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Eventually, Lot inches his way into the city. His family life becomes devastated because he made the wrong choices of priorities in life. Abram could have taken his first pick himself because he's the one God called, he's the one God has chosen, and he's the oldest. Instead, he's selfless. He kind of figured out, I don't care which way Lot goes. God called me, the favor stays with me. If God puts you with somebody favored, you stay there. Don't you break that connection. It could cost you heavily. So in Genesis 13, we see Abram's vision is now tested by conflict. In Genesis chapter 14, Abraham rescues Lot from being taken captive. The kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, they have been defeated. And all their families and all their livestock and all their treasures and all their possessions have been taken by a group of Babylonian kings. And as a consequence, Lot and his family are taken hostage too. Well, Uncle Abram puts together an army of his servants and he rescues Lot and family and all the other people and all their goods and possessions that had been taken by these pagan kings. After the battle, Abram meets Melchizedek, king of Salem. Verse 18, King Melchizedek possessed a couple of unique qualities. Number one, he's a priest. The only other priest king in the Bible is Jesus. Secondly, no one could trace his human origin, Hebrews 7, verse 3. That's why Hebrews says Jesus was a priest after the order of Melchizedek. No beginning, no end. Melchizedek. Most theologians think that was a pre-incarnate appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ. He wasn't from the earthly, normal, high priestly line of Aaron. Jesus was a king priest after supernatural origin. He was the only priest without human sin, which is the only way Jesus could be our Savior. So what does Abraham do when he meets this Christ-like figure? He pays him tithes, verse 20. In fact, this is the first mention of somebody giving 10% as an act of worship in the Bible, and it occurs 400 years before the law of Moses. So you see, tithing actually predates the law. Abraham worshiped God by giving, by tithing, but this wasn't the end of his mastery of stewardship. The king of Sodom offers for Abraham to keep the spoils of the battle. Oh, Abram had just won. Now, it seems kind of haughty to me that this king offers Abram something he lost in battle and Abraham regained because to the victor go the spoils. So he's offering something that really isn't his to offer. But Abraham turns it down. He refused the offer because he didn't want the king of Sodom and Gomorrah to ever be able to say, I made Abram rich. Abram wanted everybody to know it was his God, not man, that blessed him. He was able to refuse material goods based on principle. Good thought. So we see Abraham's vision is not only tested by famine, failure, by conflict, but by warfare and by prosperity. Isn't that fun to know? Buckle up. Put your seat track ta tables in the upright position and, and prepare yourself for a bumpy flight. It's going to happen to everybody I don't know of anybody who's achieved anything without pretty severe testing. I mean, really, that'll slim the flock down real quick. And that's all the stuff that comes before the word afterward. Afterward, the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision. Do you see the pattern here? After Abram stepped out by faith and left his homeland. After he had been through the famine. After he had embarrassed himself by lying to Abimelech. After he had the dissension with his family member, Lot. After he had fought and won the battle with Babylonian kings. After he passed the test with his possessions. After those tests, God appeared to him in a vision. Now, a lot of us would have given up after one of those tests. 
And that's the reason a lot of dreams from God never come true. We give up just too quick, right? Whether we realize our dreams, uh, I think the key is knowing they got to be and will be tested. They must be. And we got to have a better attitude about those tests and a positive attitude if we're going to realize our dreams. In other words, the test has to come. It shouldn't be a surprise, shouldn't be a shock, because you know if you're more than a conqueror, you can deal with this thing. I can get through this thing. Those who see their God-given dreams fulfilled are the ones who persevere through tough times. They are people with grit, G-R-I-T, guts, resilience, industriousness, and tenacity, grit. Notice it's not IQ. It's just gutsy grit, a tenacity that says, come hell or high water, I'm in. I'm not kind of in, I'm in. Live or die, sink or swim, I'm betting the farm, I'm in, 100% committed. Their tenacity and perseverance won the day. They're like Jacob wrestling with God, refusing to quit till they get God's blessing. That's the biggest difference between winners and losers in every field, business, sports, marriage, and family life. And a lot of them succeed because they've got a superior attitude about the test. Now, you're wrong if you're thinking that intelligent and brilliant people are the only people that can achieve their dreams. People who fulfill their God-given dreams are not always the most brilliant. They're not always the most resource. Right? Let's keep her going. They're not the most brilliant. They're not the ones that have the most resources. They're people who simply refuse to quit. Yeah, yeah. people who fulfill their God-given dreams are people who refuse to quit. Right. They're not the most brilliant. They're not the most talented, not always better skilled than you. They don't always have the best of resources. They're just people who refuse to let go of their dream. Yeah. You know, walls are for a reason. They keep people out that don't really, really need to get in. And if we're persistent, you get the key to entrance. There's no free lunch here. See, this is a thing a lot of people don't know. They wonder why there's rejection and they give up easily without persistence. What does the Bible say? You have need of endurance. King James says patience. The word is endurance. You have need of endurance, persistence, that after you've done the will of God, you might obtain the promise. We, we want to get the promise the moment we obey, and God says, it doesn't always work that way. You have need of endurance. It's a marathon. It may not happen quickly, but it will happen. So you need endurance, you need patience, you need tenacity in order to see that promise come true. I mean, Abraham was 100 before he got a kid. That's sweating it out, isn't it? So, <laughs> I, I wanted to take a trip around the block there, but I'm not going to do it. Okay. A, I'll hear from my wife, and I'll have to take Uber home. I'm not going to do it. I, I thought it would be good, though. Walt Disney was fired by a newspaper editor because he lacked creativity. Walt went bankrupt a few times before he built Disneyland. Huh? Leo Tolstoy, author of War and Peace, flunked out of college, described by professors as unable and unwilling to learn. I have a dog like that, you know. <laughs> Michael Jordan, perhaps the greatest basketball player of all time, didn't even make the high school basketball team his sophomore year. Beethoven's teacher called him hopeless as a composer. Winston Churchill failed the sixth grade. He didn't become prime minister until he was 62 years of age. His greatest contributions came after he was a senior citizen. Wake up, you folks drooling on yourself out there. Your best days are just ahead of you. Henry Ford failed and went broke five times before he finally succeeded. Just look at the life of the greatest example of a person who achieved his dream, Jesus. And what was the dream? Saving mankind from its sin, the salvation of humanity. Jesus, though God in the flesh, knew for a fact this is not going to be easy, that he and his mission would be tested, tested by Satan himself, tested by the unbelief of the disciples, tested by the people surrounding him, and even tested in the Garden of Gethsemane. But what made Jesus the ultimate achiever of that dream and purpose was he never lost his focus. He never quit. He knew it wouldn't be easy, so he prepared himself for the obstacles that would surely come his way. And the result of him not quitting 
is your salvation and mine and the gift of eternal life. See, God's will through the patriarchs or any other saint was never realized overnight. You know, we live in America. I want it now. I want it on my table in 15 minutes or lunch is free. That isn't going to work in the kingdom, okay? You need to wake up and smell the roses and you need to read to see what happens in people's lives. We turn a page in a Bible and you just turn 70 years in a person's life. And you know, you think these people get a miracle every day. It's not true. There are miracles there, but they ain't every day. If I could get one every day, how many of you are with me? I would. Not every day. You got to wait sometimes a long time. Can you, can you patiently endure? See, for most of them, it took years of testing, molding, and refining. I mean, look how long it took David to get to the throne. And Joseph, something like uh, almost 21 years. Most of us would have bailed after a month and quit. So the question you might ask is, well, why do I have to be tested to realize God's dream? Before promotion always comes a test because God doesn't give his dreams to people who are double-minded or cluttered with other things. Let not that man think he shall receive anything from the Lord. Double-minded. He wants you focused and single-minded. He needs our undivided attention. So tests and trials are not meant to discourage us. They're meant to draw us closer to God because you need him. Hello? A.W. Tozer said, it's doubtful God can use any man greatly until he's hurt him deeply. Tests can also be God's pruning shears. John 15, verse 1 and 2. Jesus said to his disciples, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts away every branch of mine that doesn't bear fruit, but he trims and cleans every branch that does produce fruit so that it might produce even more fruit. Then Jesus went on to say in verse 5, I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you stay joined to me and stay, I stay joined to you, you're going to produce lots of fruit, but you can do nothing without me. Now here's a, I'm going to just be as transparent as I know. I've always thought, I can do this. Mother, I can do it. I can do it myself. And if you're honest, I don't care how spiritual you are, baptized in the Holy Spirit, whether you have visions and speak in tongues more than anybody. Let me tell you something. There's still something inert in man that says, I can do this. I can make this work. I can get out of this jam. I am smart enough, intelligent enough, creative enough, clever enough to make it work. It's in all of us. It is in all. So guess what the test does? It proves you can't. When God gives you a promise, you try everything to make it come true until you finally said, I can do nothing without him. It's true. It's true. It's tempting when the road is smooth, the sun is shining, and you think you're doing it all without God's help. But you're not. Without him, we couldn't do anything. Having our dream tested helps me remember I can't make it happen. See, Abram was to the point God could say, now, Abram, I want to talk to you about something. And little Abram was finally prepared to listen. It was afterward, after the storms of life. A young naval student was being put through the paces by an old sea captain. And the captain said, son, what would you do if a sudden storm sprang up on the starboard? And the kid said, throw out the anchor, sir. Then the captain says, what would you do if another storm sprang up aft? Throw out another anchor, sir. And if another terrific storm sprang up forward, what would you do? Throw out another anchor, sir. And the captain said, whoa, wait a minute. Where are you getting all these anchors? <laughs> and the young cadet said, from the same place you're getting all those storms, sir. <laughs> You don't have to worry whether or not God has enough anchors for your storms. Abram passed the test, so God gave him vision. And the first attitude to realizing any God-given dream is, my dream will be tested. Yeah. Number two, replace fear with faith. Yeah. Replace fear with faith. He said, do not be afraid, Abram. I will protect you. Yeah. Now, you talk about a security system, that'll work. What might Abraham be afraid of at this point? The retribution of Babylonian kings he had defeated in battle? 
the wrath of King Abimelech for lying about his wife and nearly getting him killed? No, Abram had already survived those tests. The greatest test for Abraham was the test of his faith. God had promised to make him great and make him the head of a great nation. But you know the problem. He's old. Abram and Sarah are old and childless. How could God possibly hope to fulfill his promise to Abraham to be the father of many nations? And he hadn't got a kid. And he's old. Like some of you. Old. (laughs) And he was very old. There's a scripture that says that. And I thought, dear God, I hope Cindy never has to say that over me. And Rick was old. (laughs) God help me. I don't know, there's something in me that wants to live, you know. I'm not into that get old nonsense stuff. I don't even want to think old, talk old, religious old, same old thing. God's into new. I want to run and not be weary, walk and not faint. Renew my youth like the eagle, O Lord. I want what what you gave uh, uh, Moses, you know. His natural forces were not abated, nor was his eyes grow dim. Why not? Why not? You say, well, Rick, you're asking for an awful lot. Well, duh, yeah. I got an unlimited God who can raise the dead. Don't you think we ought to ask for something besides a parking space? I think so. But Abraham believed the Lord in spite of the fact nothing would work. It wasn't any Cialis or anything else that's going to help 90-year-old mama and a 100-year-old man. So he had faith in the promise of God, but he didn't know how. And I'm going to tell you something. It's okay not to know how. I've been confident many times in storms that God would prevail, God would come through. Philippians 1, 6, that which I have begun in you, I will perform it till the day of Jesus. I've stood on that. But I have also said, I sure don't know how you're going to do it. That's not unbelief. I don't know how you're going to do it. But I am confident you'll do it. And Abraham was trying to figure out how God would do it. So Abraham suggested to God that his trusted servant Eliezer of Damascus become the promised son. But that wasn't going to work. Sarah's plan, I like this plan, Sarah's plan was for Abraham to have a child by her Egyptian maidservant, Hagar. Can you imagine that conversation? Abe, I've been thinking, you know, we're getting way down the line. Doesn't look like we're going to have a baby at all. I got an idea. How about you sleep with Hagar? Abraham said, well, darling, if, if whatever, whatever you wish. Uh, that's a heavy burden to put on me, but I'll pray about it, and thy will be done. Okay. Have, don't you people ever put yourself in a story to figure out these are real people? They're just as flawed as you and me. But both plans were in the flesh. Both alternatives were motivated by fear. I got to help God out. That's the issue. But God wanted Abraham's child to be a child of faith, not fear. Don't be afraid, Abraham. Just because it's humanly impossible doesn't mean it's divinely impossible. George Mueller once said this, faith does not operate in the realm of the possible There's no glory for God in what is humanly possible. Faith begins where man's power ends. I like that. If you can do it, you don't need God. The Bible tells us that nothing is impossible with God. He delights in impossibilities. You might say to me, Rick, I can't see God working on my dreams in life, in my situation or circumstances at the moment. I don't sense it. You know, a boy was flying his kite. A passerby looked up in the sky. He couldn't see the kite. It was so high, it was out of sight. And he asked the kid, what are you doing? He said, I'm flying my kite. How do you know it's there? You can't see it. He said, I can feel the tug on the string. And you may not always sense his presence or see him visible in your dream or circumstances, but God is always there. And you can't see him, but you can feel the tug of conviction that he puts on your heart. And you can go on faith, believing his promises are true. Chuck Swindoll tells the story of a village in northern India. Everyone brought their wares to this village to trade and sell. And one old farmer brought a whole covey of quail. He had tied a string around one leg of each bird, right? And the other ends of all the strings were tied to a ring, which fit loosely over a stick in the middle. 
And he had taught the quail to walk in a circle around and around like mules in a sugar cane factory. Nobody was interested in buying the birds until a devout Hindu came by. And the Hindu religion taught him respect for all human life. So he believed the birds should be set free. So he said, I want to buy all the quail. And the guy was elated. And after receiving the money, he was a bit shocked to hear the buyer say, now I want you to set all of them free. What? He said to the man that had just bought them. You heard me. Cut the strings off their legs, turn them loose, set them all free. And with a shrug, the old farmer bent down, snipped the strings off the quail. They were free at last, free at last. And what happened? The birds continued going around in a circle. Finally, the man had to shoo them off, and then they landed a little distance away, and they simply resumed their predictable, unfeathered path, although they're released. But they kept going in circles, still bound, still tied, though free. Don't go around and around in circles of fear and insecurity and timidity. If the Son has made you free, you have a right to be free indeed. Don't let fear paralyze you into the monotony of the routine of an addiction or whatever it may have been. You have a right to be free. You shall be free. And number three, the last attitude. Recognize that a great reward always awaits you. How did Abraham move? It says, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city that hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. That's Hebrews 11, verse 9 and 10. Abraham obeyed God. He believed God. And let's see exactly the kind of faith he had, a decisive, obedient faith. He obeyed, and he went out not knowing exactly where he was going. When God called, he acted immediately. Didn't hesitate, didn't argue, didn't question, didn't waver back and forth. He just simply obeyed. He did not know where he was going. He simply believed God's promise. Therefore, he acted on his belief. He believed, therefore, he obeyed. When a person really believes whatever God has said in his word, they simply obey it. There's no such thing as belief and no obedience. Not one of us knows where our faith will ultimately lead us, but we're not to fear following God. I know God is good. I know He has good things in store for any follower of Him. His plans for you are good and not evil to give you a hope and a future. Jeremiah 29 verse 11. If we shrink back and refuse to believe and follow God, then we miss out on the reward of His promises. You know, he even lived to a ripe old age, old Abraham, seeing both his son Isaac and his grandson Jacob born. He witnessed them becoming the heirs of his promise. But even they were heirs of the promise, not the inheritors of the land. Not yet. He never saw them receive one piece of land. But despite it all, and what appeared to be against all odds and against the promises of God from ever being fulfilled, Abraham believed God. And he still believed in the hope God had given him. He believed it so strongly that he taught those same promises to his son Isaac and his grandson Jacob. When God called Abraham to leave the Ur of Chaldees to go to a land where he should receive for an inheritance, the author of Hebrews writes this, Abraham obeyed and he went out not knowing whether he went. That's faith. Why did he obey? Because he knew for a fact God will not call him out of a comfort zone for nothing. He knew for a fact God had something wonderful in store for him. And I can promise you this year, he's got some good things in store for you. I don't always understand it. I can't figure it out. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I have never doubted one time in a storm that that storm is not permanent, but God's promises are. And I can stand on those promises when everything is shaking. God said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall not pass away. So I stand on that word as an anchor in my soul. I mean, it may look bad. And if you read these descriptions of people in the Bible, it looked bad, terrible. But God always fulfilled his word. In fact, when Israel finally got in the land, Joshua told the nation, not one word that God promised has failed to come true. And you can put that in the bank for 2020. Thank you for watching today's message. Subscribe today to be up to date on all of Pastor Rick's messages. And be sure to visit SummonSA.com for more information.